So, <clears throat> where are we? So this morning's reading uh, comes from the Book of Geek in the Old Testament. In the beginning, the software was without form and void. The architect said, let there be light, and they separated the light from the darkness. And they called the light architecture, and they called the darkness hacking. And that was the first project. <coughs> On the second project, the architects used all the technologies of the heavens and earth they hadn't got round to the first time. The simple new was replaced by a factory, which was replaced by dependency injection, which was replaced by an IOC container, which was augmented by XML configuration, which was supplemented by annotations. But they were not done yet. The simple save was replaced by a data access object. Who remembers those? Who still uses them? Oh. <laughs> Which was replaced by a unit of work pattern. Where's Martin? Which was replaced by a custom ORM. Which was replaced by Hibernate, which is called nHibernate by the Redmondites. Which was partly replaced by Abatis, because we didn't replace it everywhere. You just replaced it a bit. Now you've got two OR ORMs to worry about which was replaced by EJB3, which was not really replaced by Active Record. And still they toiled. The simple, what does that say? Wow, compile, there we go. Yeah, the simple compile was replaced by a make file, uh, which was replaced by an ant build XML, which is called Nant by the Redmondites, which was replaced by many build XML files, which was generated by an XSLT transfer. I was on that project. There was a project that had an XSLT, an XSL transform, that would take input and generate two million lines <laughs> of build XMLs across many. Oh, wow. Happy days. Which was replaced by Maven. And Maven brought forth a plague of Apache Commons, and there was a flood of all the libraries of the internet as a judgment upon the people. <laughs> And that was the second project. There's a phenomenon known as the second system effect, where if you let people who write one system build a second system, build the replacement of that system, um, they act out a whole bunch of things they never got to do the first time. So uh, all of the ideas they had, you know, they just, oh, we need this thing to work. Oh, OK, well, if we just have to get it to work, we'll just put something together that works. Now we need it to be enterprise. Ooh, OK. Well, that means I get to do all this other stuff. And this is called the second system effect. Um, you'll see this a lot, uh, especially people who call themselves enterprise architects, or even worse, who get called enterprise architects by other people. <laughs> the architects were fruitful and multiplied. They decided to build an architecture that would reach to the heavens to show how clever and wise they were, and remote invocation would be its name. And it came to pass, they were scattered to the four winds and began to speak in different tongues. Some spoke in Korba, which was called Decom by the Redmondites. The Sunites spoke the, ling the language of Jindi, of the Ejabites, which was Exomelish and verbose. And there was a plague of standards to test the people. These are the generations of RPC. RPC begat RMI, which begat COM and object brokers. COM begat Decom, which begat WCF. Object brokers begat web services. Web services married XML, and they begat SOAP and WSDL. SOAP begat the 1,200 tribes of WS Death Star. <laughs> WSDL begat code-generated stubs, and the people wrung their hands and wept. <laughs> On the seventh day, they rested. <laughs> um, Thus ends the reading. <laughs> so this is what we do, OK? We, we just overcomplicate these things. We over-engineer over things. So this is how it works. We observe a pattern. We see a thing that happens more than once, typically only twice, but more than once. And we're, we're designed to see patterns. Oh, I saw this thing that's nearly like that. So we go, OK, well, what we're going to do is we're going to create an abstraction. We're going to create a generalization, because that's useful. That's a thing that might help. Because we're just trying to help, right? So then abstractions, we turn into a framework, and we go, hey, not only can I describe this idea, I can 
give you a thing that does it for you. You don't have to think. Okay? So the framework then becomes a golden hammer. We will use, I don't know, insert uh, Bruby on Brails everywhere, right? That's what we're going to use, yeah? And then people start to subvert the framework because it isn't quite what they need. It doesn't quite work. Um, and then finally, sometimes, finally, simplicity grows out of adversity. So um, Joe Warns, uh, my colleague over many years um, in various different guises, uh, he's, a, he's a rather uh, astonishing programmer. He also makes up words. Uh, and one of the words he made up, or two of the words he made up, he talks about complifying and simplicating. <laughs> so, um, so complifying is making something much harder than it needs to be. Okay? Um, simplicating is the opposite. Simplicating is seeing the simplicity, the inherent simplicity in something and pulling it out. Okay. There's, I think there might be a core behavioral difference between OO programmers and functional programmers. Which side of that they sit? That's all I'm saying about that. Um, so, what's this? What are you looking at? The clue's in the title. I put the title up there and you still aren't seeing it. <laughs> you're looking at two three-quarter circles. What do you think you're looking at? You think you're looking at a grey square in the middle, don't you? Um, this is how our brain's wired. Our brain is wired to make sense of incomplete data. Because what we get in life is incomplete data. So um, we're programmed to see structure. So what does this mean? Um, even when none exists. So we distort, delete, and generalize. This is one of the sort of core principles of behavioral psychology, and particularly uh, neurolinguistic programming, NLP, is this like, the idea that any information coming in we distort it, we delete it, we generalize it. So distorting it is all of the different cognitive biases, like uh, attribution bias, confirmation bias, all of those things. Deleting, in particular with confirmation bias, is when information comes in that doesn't agree with my model of the world, I, I, just, I literally, my unconscious, doesn't even hear it. Okay? How many times have you been speaking to someone and you felt they haven't been listening to you, and then you say something and they, suddenly they're engaged? Yeah? Usually you know, your partner. <laughs> um, and, and that's what they're doing. They're filtering stuff out until you say something they think is interesting and then they engage. Okay? Say more interesting stuff. How about that? Um, and generalize is how we do this pattern matching thing. So we, we complify where we should simplicate. Uh, fantastic book I want to tell you to go and read. Uh, it's a book called Influence by a guy called Robert Cialdini, who's an advertising guy. And he doesn't call it a book about advertising, he calls, about, uh, and he calls it a book about the compliance profession. Okay, these guys are, are, so advertising people are experts in making you comply with what they want you to do. And they do that by messing with you. So a lot of this stuff comes from there. Um, so what am I saying then? If I were going to Dublin, there's a lovely, there's a lovely joke that starts, uh, this, this chap's come, uh, his, overhears this guy with an Irish accent. He says, oh, you're from Ireland. He says, yeah. He says, uh, well, I want to get to Dublin. How do I get to Dublin? And the Irishman says, ah. If I were going to Dublin, I wouldn't start from here. It's like, oh. So, so, so the problem we've got is we're starting from here. Yeah? And we go, oh, I'd like to do this thing. Um, agile transformations. Yeah? So uh, you need to set up Scrum. You need to set up you know, Scrum Masters. And uh, well, well, we don't have that. We're starting from here. Ah, no, but you have to start from here, the thing that Scrum says. Oh. You know, XP is a similar thing. I'm not just ragging on Scrum. I'm saying these things. Uh, I need to wrap up quickly. Um, so. Start where you are, okay? Try to see what's really there. Terry Pratchett, uh, who's read Terry Pratchett books? Excellent, I'm in a room full of nerds. Loads of hands went up, that's great. Um, Terry Pratchett has three of his characters are witches. Well, actually, several of his characters are witches, but three in particular. Um, and one of them, Granny Weatherwax, um, she talks about uh, witchcraft and, and, and what it means. And someone says, oh, I know witchcraft, that's having second sight, isn't it? And she says, no, no. She says, witchcraft is having first sight. It's seeing what's really there. It's uh, pretty deep. So what's actually slowing you down? Okay? It may be all of these frameworks and all of these libraries and all of these bits of architecture you've pulled in are the reason that you think you need all these bits of architecture. It could be a self-sustaining problem. Um, when you externalize a, a question, when you're sitting in there 
the parts of the brain you use and the cognitive processes you use to externalize a problem to someone else um, are different from the ones when you have your internal dialogue, which is why you get this phenomenon where you go up to someone and you say, can you think how I could possibly... Don't worry, I've got it. How often does that happen? Yeah, a lot, right? <laughs> and this is why. And so I actually have a bath duck. I have a little yellow bath duck. I don't have it here. It's in the hotel room. I, it travels with me. When, I'm, when I don't have someone to pair with, I, I talk to the bath duck, because talking to yourself would be mad, right? So <laughs> I've got a bath duck. Um, and the Amazon stand downstairs has got these little sort of these little rubber skittle people like this, with just big smiles in their faces. Just go, go and grab one of those if they've got any left, because they're, they're like perfect bath ducks, because they just smile at you. Do you think I should do this crazy thing? OK, I'll do the crazy thing. Um, you know, ask yourself, do you really need another logging library? And I just want to leave you with this quote. I love this. Oliver Wendell Holmes, he says, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And this is uh, you know, simple versus uh, simplistic, if you like. It's just a lovely thing. Um, so that's kind of all I wanted to say. I just want to leave you with this lovely picture. Um, the picture on the left is, uh, the, um, is how you parse the, is, is the, is the structure of the Ruby language. The thing on the right is the structure of the Python language. OK? Just saying. <laughs> um, that's all I've got. I've, I guess, do you want some questions? Anyone got anything to ask? What's my duck's name? Ah, excellent. My duck, my duck didn't have a name until three days ago. No, Thursday last week. Thursday last week, um, my duck got, got a name. Um, and the, re the way my duck got a name was there's a, a, uh, a, a girl called Cara, who I met at another conference uh, last week in, in Cambridge. And she's one of the organizers. And we were having this conversation about you know, externalizing things. And, and, and one of the sessions there was about you know, using a duck and externalizing and how you pair and that kind of thing. And she said, oh, right, like an epiphany duck. And I just went, what? And she said, yeah, we call it an epiphany duck. Because right? you, you speak to the duck, and as you speak to the duck, you have an epiphany. So my duck is now called Epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Epiphany Duck. So I, I, that, that, that's who I speak to. Yeah. OK, thank you. Right, thanks. <laughs>